Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we both welcome you back to another important episode of The New World Next Week, which you can find all the information and pertinent files and formats for you to share this information at NewWorldNextWeek.com. James, yet again, so very much to get into as we are in strange and interesting and dangerous times, I think. We will begin with a story from the National Post, but like probably millions of other people out there, I first heard about it this very morning on face space and jitter and all the social network holes. Joseph Coney viral video campaign clouded in controversy. A documentary film aimed at exposing the heinous acts of Ugandan war criminal Joseph Coney, and that's K-O-N-Y, exploded over the internet Wednesday drawing praise and condemnation from the millions who viewed it. The half-hour film, Coney 2012, made by the U.S. organization Invisible Children, tells the story of a child soldier named Jacob and the charity's push to have the U.S. intervene to stop the LRA. That would be the Lord's Resistance Army. The campaign is kicked off just as the LRA, a cultish militia led by Coney that has terrorized parts of Africa for decades, launched a new spate of attacks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Millions of Twitter users use the hashtag Stop Coney, vying for the top trending spot among other popular topics today like the iPad 3 and football players like Peyton Manning. Dear Joseph Coney, I'm going to help make you famous hip-hop icon P. Diddy, and there were other folks, Bieber and Rihanna and all your favorites in the Papa culture kingdom, spreading the word, hopping on the bandwagon as, as so many folks do. But continuing... The film's narrator, Jason Russell, explains how U.S. advisors to Uganda could train government forces in the technology needed to hunt down Mr. Coney in the jungle. Last October, U.S. President Barack Obama agreed to send 100 troops. But the campaign has been met with suspicion and condemnation with some critics denouncing the push to hunt down Coney as irresponsible and immoral. Quote, the immediate question is whether Coney is captured or killed, end quote, wrote Ph.D. student Jack McDonald from King's College, London, that while he supports the desire to raise the profile, as so many folks do and would, of the heinous nature of Coney's crimes, considering this whole kind of viral marketing campaign dangerous, the idea that popular opinion can be leveraged with viral marketing to induce foreign military intervention is really, really dangerous. It is immoral to try and sell a sanitized version of foreign intervention that neglects the fact that people will die as a result. That goes for politicians as much as Jason Russell. Invisible Children did not respond to a request for comment, as, of course, they are no doubt deluged with all of this going on. James, before I throw it back to you, this, this really kind of struck on something I've kind of seen woven throughout many of the other stories playing out on the, on the geopolitical stage right now. And for me, it kind of seems to be part and parcel with the, the finalization of turning the well-meaning progressive Democratic left, the complete capitulation, and, and just turning into calling for the bloodlust. Yay, we killed Osama. You know, yay, Andrew Breitbart's dead, which, by the way, I'm waiting for the videos he was going to put out. And, you know, yay, we're sending threatening messages to Limbaugh and, and all of these things. We love it when our cool blue singing president brings on the, the terror, just like the other cool saxophone player that, you know, burnt, burnt down that evil church in the 90s. But Kucinich also lost his seat yesterday in Ohio, which I see as another kind of signpost that ultimately people are selling their souls over to this new world order. James? Well, that's exactly the point, isn't it? That's exactly right, because it's always endlessly fascinating to me to watch how literally millions upon millions of people who probably don't, couldn't, can't even place Uganda on a map uh, and who had never heard of, of this guy, Kony, before last, you know, last, literally one week ago, had never even heard of this, now find this to be, you know, this is the pressing political issue. And millions upon millions of people can be led into this by, you know, the tweets of P. Diddy and Kim Kardashian and people like this into, into thinking this is a pressing political issue right now, although this is something that's been going on for, you know, 20 years and it involves all this backstory and everything. 
and uh, and never think to question why this is being put in front of them right now and whether this actually serves the interests of the, uh, the, the foreign interventionists and the military industrial complex and all of these people, the war profiteers and the people who want a justification for increasing American and Western intervention in Africa and the, uh, the further establishment of AFRICOM and all of these, these grand political ideas that this plays into. And of course, they can deflect any criticism of that by saying, oh, well, if, if you're not for, for getting Coney, then you're, you're for child torture and kidnap. Uh, and just simplistic arguments like that. Oh, if you're not for the police looking at all of your ISP activity, you're for the child pornographers. It's, it's the uh, moral equivalent of that type of argument. So, um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch this and how this becomes the celeb flavor of the week, like, uh, like the Darfur genocide uh, campaign a few years ago. And now that South Sudan has been created and there's the Western toehold in, in that area so that they can get their hands on the oil, suddenly no one cares about Darfur anymore. And I guarantee you in a few years, no one will care about Kony anymore or the fact that he hasn't even been in Uganda for the last six years. But let's not complicate people with the actual facts of the situation, what's actually going on. Let's just try to simplify it all into this tiny little, you know, Kony 2012 catchphrase that can be tweeted out without any substance, without anyone knowing what's going on, but will provide the justification for what's going to be the next stage of intervention. And when they can't get Kony, oh, well, we'll have to send in the drones, we'll have to send in the SEALs, we'll have to increase American presence in the region. And it's just, uh, it's just all part of this, this cycle, this spin cycle that, uh, that just justifies more and more intervention. And exactly as you indicate, the left can get on board. Yay, this is bombing people that we can get behind. Yay, go Team America. And James, I, I think ultimately just to wrap all this up, it's, it's so much effort spent on something that, again, I'm not saying is not important, but ultimately, what about all the dead kids and the bastards in your own neighborhoods, in your town where you live? That's all I would say. Or anywhere else in the world. Why don't we get upset about dictators that we're not being told by P. Diddy and the like to be, to be angry at? I mean, why, why is it always we have to follow whatever these people are tweeting out as their flavor of the week? Our second story, as long as we're on the cyberspace war, LulzSec hackers charged after ringleader turns informant. James from USA Today, five members of the elite hacking group LulzSec have been charged with cyber attacks following an international investigation in which a ringleader of the global organization began secretly working as an FBI informant, authorities now announced just two days ago. An indictment unsealed in New York says Hector Xavier Monsigur of New York City a legendary hacker known as Sabu, that's S-A-B-U, was charged with conspiracy to engage in computer hacking, among other offenses, and pleaded guilty in August. According to the court papers, and we do have the links for you and the indictments unsealed, Monsegur was an influential member of three hacking organizations, Anonymous, Internet Feds, and LOL Security, or LulzSec, that were responsible for multiple cyber attacks on the computer systems of various businesses and governments in the United States and throughout the world. James, I believe Webster Tarpley coined the phrase, and it is here now, and it is virtual flag terrorism. Unfortunately so, and uh, it just, I mean, there's no word for it. It just disgusts me how time and time and time and time again, literally, it seems like we talk about this every week. It's the FBI be who are puppeteering and behind the, the people who are behind these organizations that are going to commit the next big te terrorist attack or are doing the big cyber raids or whatever it is. I mean, literally, it just every week there's a new story about this. And lo and behold, surprise, this these elite cyber hackers, oh, actually, there's an FBI informant among them who are stirring them up and telling them to go and do this. And if you go and look at the story and, and the, the characters behind this, it turns out, you know, that this topiary guy was uh, was the one who was irreverent and funny, but it was this, this FBI informant who was the one who was uh, serious and political and trying to motivate people. We got to attack them. And oh, lo and behold, he turns out to be FBI. So, I mean, it's just... I cannot stress how many times this has happened and we're going to continue to see it happen because people won't look behind behind the headlines and we'll just see, ooh, you know, anonymous attacks a uh, CIA website. Oh, and let's bring in the next stage of uh, the clampdown on the internet to take care of this problem that turns out to have been created by the government itself. Oh, how convenient. So I think the listeners and viewers out there know by now what this is all about, but this is for the people out there who, uh, who are caught in the matrix, who don't understand how the system works. It always 
always works like this. The system attacks itself in order to, to gain more power in the name of defense. And we're going to continue seeing that again and again and again, because it's one of the only tricks they have up their sleeve. And if we expose that trick, they can't use it anymore. And, uh, and that's the key. That's why we have to continue to get the word out about how this happens over and over and over again. Before we move to our third and final story, James, I guess I just I kind of wanted to interject here with something for the first story about this sort of, you know, selling out of the soul, giving over to this, you know, police state. Then a lot of these things really play out. And again, I, I don't call it media monarchy for nothing. A lot of these things we see playing out in in other bits of popular culture. And this is essentially the exact storyline of the television show The Walking Dead is basically uh, the subtext is we are turning into that which we claim to hate and want to destroy. And even the other night on The Simpsons, of course, they had Shepard Ferry, the creator of the, you know, the Obama Hope Gnosis Associated Press photo. He's a guest on there when Bart does street art and basically says, hey, yeah, you know, I'm working for Wiggum. He was working for the cops all along to catch Bart. He says, you know, I didn't put up those signs that said obey for 20 years for no reason. So, again, it's, it's, it's woven throughout, as, as I call it, the pop of culture. But more, much more seriously, James, in closing on our third and final story this week, as we approach a bitter one-year anniversary, we'll take it from your own FukushimaUpdate.com and its sources back to Bloomberg Children wait another year for UN radiation study. As five-year-olds charge through the corridors of a kindergarten in northeast Japan at lunchtime, a teacher says she's still unaware if their food is safe a year after the Fukushima nuclear accident. Since the March 11th earthquake and tsunami wrecked the Fukushima plant about 62 miles south of this kindergarten, parents of the 198 children have been seeking assurances that the school lunches are free of radiation. The parents talk about there's so much information, but who do you trust? There are so many conflicting reports. And that parent, as well as the other 197, as well as everyone else around the country and around the world, are going to have to wait another 14 months for a unified view on food contamination when the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation issues the first global and independent assessment of the Fukushima nuclear accident. James scheduled to be published May 2013, so everybody can just hang tight and hold your breath and chill out and everything will be cool until then. Meanwhile, James, in Vienna right now, of course, Iran tops the agenda of UN nuclear inspectors meeting in Vienna. So, you, you know, we see what's more important. Right, exactly. And if the question is, uh, who do you trust? I I'm thinking the answer probably shouldn't be the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. Um, as anyone who just looked into the history of the IAEA and its uh, deal with the WHO not to, to look at the effects of, uh, of nuclear radiation and, and all of the things that have been going on for, for decades and decades and how the nuclear uh, regulatory f bodies of all different stripes all the way up to the UN level have been in the back pocket of the industry for, for so long. And I think people who've been following the Fukushima story know all about that by now. But again, um, this is just another type of story for the public. Don't worry, just don't worry your pretty little heads about it. Just wait another 14 months and continue to, you know, send your children to the schools where they're being served these school lunches where you, you don't know what's in them. You don't know if they're safe, but don't worry. There will be a report, you know, 14 months down the line that will tell you that uh, that everything's OK and go back to go back to sleep, basically. Um, so uh, absolutely, anyone who's been following Fukushima Update and my work on this issue know that the food supply is the main issue for me. And of course, this weekend is going to be the one year anniversary of uh, Fukushima and 311 and all of that. So there's going to be some big events here in Japan, including a big march in Osaka, 10,000 people at least that are supposedly going to be there. I want to go to Osaka to cover it, but Corbett Report is brought to you by you. So I need your financial support. Best way to do that, I have a brand new DVD available for purchase from CorbettReport.com, the 2010 video archive. If I get 10 orders for this in the next three days, I will go to Osaka. I will cover it. If not, I won't have the money. I won't go. So this, this uh, media is brought to you by you. So I need your support out there to help do that and to keep FukushimaUpdate.com going. James, as we wrap up here in the remaining 40 seconds or so, we'll also remind folks that, again, every Thursday night live on your show on Republic Broadcasting, second half of the show is devoted to Food World Order, where we go over all the latest in food, environment, health, drug war, bio wars, 
all of those things, James. So we'll point folks to foodworldorder.com. And this has been episode 105 of newworldnextweek.com. Thanks, James. Thank you.